hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. All right, welcome back to the next episode of the BC Law's Just Law Podcast. I'm Tom Blakely. Today we're joined by Lisa Gotchman, uh, who is a career appellate prosecutor, a graduate of the University of Rochester and the Cardozo School of Law in New York City. She began her career as an assistant district attorney in the Peels Bureau of the Bronx District Attorney's Office in May 1987. Lisa was sworn in as a deputy attorney general in the appellate section of the Office of the New Jersey Attorney General in 2000, argued in front of the United States Supreme Court in the landmark criminal sentencing case Charles C. Apprendi Jr. versus New Jersey on behalf of the state. She currently serves of counsel counsel to the appellate section of the Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office in Freehold, New Jersey. Uh, Lisa, welcome. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you, Tom? Thank you so much for inviting me onto your podcast. For sure. Uh, well, uh, before we get started with anything, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, as you said, I'm a career prosecutor. I'm specializing in appellate work. I started at the Bronx District Attorney's Office in its appellate section, went on to the appellate section of the Division of Criminal Justice in the Office of the Attorney General in Trenton, New Jersey. And I have found that it was a wonderful way to marry my love of writing with my love of, of the law. Very, very cool. Uh, well, speaking of the <laughs> law, why? What, what, what brought you to the law? I, I know this was some time ago, earlier in your career, but when you're figuring out like, okay, well, you know, what do I want to do? What, what brought you to law school? What brought you to the legal profession originally? I was working in a publishing house after college in its subsidiary rights division, and I really enjoyed working in the publishing field, but I was making $8,000 a year, which even back in the early 1980s was completely insufficient to pay for any kind of a lifestyle in New York City. So I decided I would go to law school, and I went there to be a literary agent. You don't need to have a law degree to do that, but I thought I wanted to do something in publishing. So I started off doing that, but my first summer between, well, the summer between first year and second year, I got an internship at the Brooklyn um, Legal Aid Society Trial Division Criminal Section, and one of my first assignments was a search and seizure memorandum, and I was just hooked. I just knew that constitutional law, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, was far more interesting than any of the contracts and property law I had learned in, in my first year classes. And I just continued with that, and that's what I knew I needed. I, I needed to, to work in criminal law because it just fascinated me. Very, very cool. Uh, so you, you get started, you know, early on, you're in the uh, Bronx DA's office. What was that like? Well, when I first started, it was still pretty much an old boys network. Um, so I had to deal with that. But there were a, a lot of women coming up through the ranks at that point. So I wasn't alone there. Um, but it was a really great place to ply my trade and learn how to be an appellate attorney. We argued almost every case in the appellate division, first department in Manhattan. So that was pretty exciting for a brand new attorney to be able to go in there and argue right off the bat. And I just never looked back. I did move to New Jersey at some point, And so I joined the attorney general's office there, also doing appellate prosecution. And I had you know, multiple opportunities to argue in the New Jersey Supreme Court. I've been there about 25, 26 times already. And I had this wonderful opportunity to argue in the United States Supreme Court. Yeah. What what drew you to appellate work in particular? It seems like that's a, a common thread of your career. What, what was it you, you really found uh, interesting in terms of that specialty of work? I enjoy writing. I enjoy research to some extent, but I really enjoy writing. I love putting together what I would call a self-contained brief, where a judge just has to look at what my brief has to say, doesn't even have to look at a defendant's brief or the opposing party's brief. And I just like to make, you know, the dry black and white transcripts come to life. Um, so fast forward in a little bit. So you uh, eventually you wind up in the Supreme Court. You, you, in, your, in your book, uh, you talk about the terror, the wonder, and the joy of preparing for and arguing in front of the Supreme Court. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, and we'll get you know, into the case and sort of everything in a moment, but that, that really struck me. Could you just talk a little bit about what you, you know, meant there and talk about the terror, the joy, and, and, and the wonder of that? You know, I had argued 
at least 17 cases in the New Jersey Supreme Court by then. But the United States Supreme Court is just a completely different animal. It's the difference between, you know, acting in regional theater and making your Broadway debut. So I was, I was brought along on this tsunami that was taking me to the United States Supreme Court. I didn't really have a lot of time to think about what it actually meant because I was so darn busy. Not only was I, ha- did I have a case in the U.S. Supreme Court, I also had a caseload back in New Jersey of state cases. And so I, I didn't really have a chance to really sit and worry about it, which is a good thing. But on the other hand, I do, you know, you, you don't know what it's going to be like to stand there in front of the nine justices of the United States Supreme Court. You just have no clue until you're there what, how you're going to feel or how you're going to act. Sure. So uh, the, the case itself, Apprendi versus New Jersey, can you just introduce us to the case or sort of take us through this? You know, you're uh, you know, working with the New Jersey Attorney General. Ultimately, this you know, comes to you to argue for the Supreme Court. But first, could you just introduce us to the case and sort of take us through how it got there? Sure. Um, Charles Apprendi Jr. was a white middle-aged pharmacist living in Vineland, New Jersey, which is a sort of semi-rural town in South Jersey. And on four separate nights in 1994, he decided that he was going to fire his rifle into the home of the only black family living in his neighborhood. On the fourth night, which was a couple of days before Christmas, and he had actually used the family's black Santa Claus faces as targets on the front door. He was arrested and he admitted to the police that he had fired shots into the house because he was sending the family a message that they were unwanted in his neighborhood. He was charged with a host of um, of criminal charges in the indictment, including attempted murder against four of the family members and multiple gun possession charges. He ultimately pleaded guilty to possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose, and at the time. The prosecutor decided that there was sufficient evidence to charge Mr. Apprendi with a hate crime. And in New Jersey at the time, if you were charged with a hate crime, it was left to the judge to make the decision by a preponderance of the evidence whether or not the crime was racially motivated. So instead of the case going to a jury to decide the defendant's motivation, it was left to the judge. The defendant took his right of appeal to the New Jersey Appellate Division, which is the first appellate court, um, the intermediate appellate court. And that's where I came in. I was working in the appellate section of the Division of Criminal Justice, and the case was assigned to me. And I argued the case in the appellate division, and I won there. The appellate division upheld the constitutionality of New Jersey's hate crime statute and found that motive, which is the defendant's racial animosity, was a traditional sentencing factor that a judge could use to impose a higher sentence on the defendant. The defendant filed, um, well, he had an appeal as of right up to the New Jersey Supreme Court because there was a dissenting opinion in the appellate division. So the New Jersey Supreme Court heard the case. I again argued it was my case, so I just followed the case along. And the New Jersey Supreme Court also upheld the um, the hate crime statute, finding that it was constitutional under the Sixth Amendment to allow a judge rather than a jury to make the finding of fact that enhanced the defendant's punishment above the ordinary statutory term for possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose, which is the crime to which he pleaded guilty. The defendant then filed his petition for certiorari in the United States Supreme Court, arguing that New Jersey's hate crime statute was unconstitutional under the Sixth and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, I filed the brief in response to the petition of certiorari, and the court granted certiorari. It was one of five cases that was granted on the Friday after Thanksgiving in uh, 1999, It was the only criminal case that was granted that day. Um, We then had to go to the merits brief portion of the litigation. And at that stage, I was still the attorney assigned to the case, so I filed the merits brief. At that point, it was up in the air who was going to argue, because arguing in the United States Supreme Court is a, a rare honor. The Attorney General of New Jersey, John Farmer, 
um, brought me up to his office one day and said, Lisa, you know, I, I know what it's like to take a case from a line attorney, and I hate to do this, but this is his only chance to argue in the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, he, John Farmer was the representative of the state of New Jersey in this matter, so I couldn't argue with him. He was also my boss. But then he read my brief over the weekend and realized that he just didn't have time. I mean, the, the office of the attorney general, he is, he is torn in so many different directions. And he said, Lisa, I want you to argue the case. And that's how I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to argue in the United States Supreme Court. Wow. And thank you for that background. I, I wanted to uh, go back to one moment you mentioned. You said the day after Thanksgiving in 1999, you find out that, that uh, certiorari has been granted in this case. What was that like to find this out, that this thing's going all the way to the Supreme Court? Were, were you expecting that? I mean, I know it's, a, as you said, a rare honor and a rarity for a case to get that far. But what was it like to find that out? I kind of anticipated that this case was going to be taken by the United States Supreme Court. In the 18 months that the case had gone through the New Jersey uh, State Supreme Court, two opinions were released by the United States Supreme Court on the sentencing factor versus element of the offense debate. In other words, what should a jury consider? What can a judge consider? And so we knew that the Apprendi case was clean. It didn't have any procedural hurdles that would preclude the court from taking the case. It was also, because it was a state case, and rather than, um, and, and the United States Supreme Court was considering a statute enacted by the state legislature. The Supreme Court of the United States owes no deference to state legislatures. The cases that had come before concerned federal statutes. And in that instance, the United States Supreme Court does owe deference to Congress, which is a co-equal branch of government. So they didn't have to apply that deference to the Apprendi case. It was a state case. And I had a feeling that the court was going to take this one. But even when they did, it was just very surreal to know that one of my cases was going to the United States Supreme Court. It was really exciting. Sure, I imagine. Um, so you you find out from the Attorney General that after all, you are gonna, uh, you know, you, you are going to do the oral argument in this case. You are going to get to the Supreme Court. How does one prepare for oral arguments at the Supreme Court? Well, you prepare the way that you would before any court. You know the facts. You know the law. But in the United States Supreme Court. I mean, first of all, I mean, these are these are just the gods of of appellate work. Um, you just prepare. You just I had this was pre-internet, and I had copies of every case, every law review article, every brief in my office, in my house. So if I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, you know, panicking about who, which justice wrote which opinion, I could just go downstairs and look through my stack of papers and find that opinion. You just keep going. You rise to the occasion. Um, I had read numerous articles while I was preparing as to how to prepare. And again, just know the law, know the facts, and hope all goes well. Sure. So you get to the Supreme Court. It's, uh, as I understand, March 28th, 2000, the oral arguments in this case. You, you you enter the Supreme Court. What was that like? What were you thinking? What was going through your head? How did it feel? Like, what, you know, what was the biggest surprise? The biggest surprise to me was how close I was to the justices sitting at council table. And the podium is right at council table. You don't get up and walk to a separate podium the way you do in most appellate courtrooms. So when I stood up and I was facing the nine justices, if I were addressing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who at that time was sitting to my far left, I could not see Justice Stephen Breyer, who was sitting to my far right in my peripheral vision. And I was really surprised at how close I was um, in a way that made it a little easier for me to argue because it blocked out everything around me and behind me. The courtroom, this is theater in the round, and I'm standing in the middle of it, and I've got justices in front of me, I've got spectators in back of me, I've got the Supreme Court, excuse me, <clears throat> the Supreme Court press corps to my left, I've got visiting dignitaries to my right, and so 
being so close to the justices, I was able to block out everything else behind me and just be in my lawyer zone. Very interesting. And and, and how did that feel being there? I, I know you're you know you're so close to these justices; they're they're right in front of you. You got all these folks and you know inside. But you know, how, how did it feel to to be there and, and to be doing this? It wasn't lost on me what an momentous occasion this was. Um, but I just argued. I mean. That was my job and that's what I had to do. There was one moment when I was being asked a question by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. And I remember thinking to myself halfway through the question that this is so cool. Justice O'Connor is asking me a question because when I first started law school back in 1981, Justice O'Connor had just been appointed to, as the first female associate justice to the United States Supreme Court. So that was a pretty momentous occasion for female attorneys and females everywhere in the United States. So to have her ask me a question was pretty, pretty cool. Sure. I can imagine. Um, so, uh, well, Ultimately, um, Apprendi does win the case, but you're there and you're, you know, having these oral arguments. They're asking you questions. The other side, you know, ha- has their turn. Did you have a sense for how it was going? How the justices were, you know, reacting, or you know, was there a sense of the the, the a, a barometer in any way of which way this was going? Did you get any sense at all from from the justices, or you know, were they neutral? How was that? When I walked into the courtroom, I knew that the court was fairly evenly divided, four four, with Justice Thomas as the swing vote. Uh, And that was based on the cases that the Supreme Court had decided within the 18 months um, prior. Um, The cases were Jones versus United States and United States versus Almendarez Torres. So I kind of knew I had four justices on my side, four justices against me. And I my my immediate goal was to get Justice Thomas on my side if I could not get any of the others. Um, The most difficult Justice was Justice Scalia. He was, he's, he's very firm on jury trials and he gave me a very difficult time. In fact, at one point, Chief Justice Rehnquist turned to him and ordered him to let me an- finish answering the question. But I knew that Scalia and I, what happened with Scalia was The case in Apprendi, the issue in Apprendi, was diametrically opposed to a a case that had come out in the death penalty, um, in a a death penalty case 10 years earlier, Walton versus Arizona. And the position that Justice Scalia was taking in Apprendi was, countered his position that he took in Walton versus Arizona. And when I tried to point that out to him, he wasn't having any of it. And as it turns out, a couple of years after the Apprendi decision, he had to begrudgingly admit that he was wrong regarding Walton versus Arizona. So I guess I won the battle, but I lost the war because, as you mentioned, I did lose the Apprendi case. It was a 5-4 decision. Justice Thomas, as it turns out, was not a swing vote at all. In the concurring opinion to Apprendi, he wrote that in Almendarez Torres, which is the case that he came out on my side, um, he voted the wrong way. So I never had him at all, but I'm glad that I didn't know that going into the argument because it must be very demoralizing to prepare and go down to Washington, D.C. You know, you're not on home turf at that point. You're, you're, you know, you're, you're in some other town. Um, and to never, and to know that you're going to argue a case and you're never going to win, that's got to be really hard. So at least I thought I had a shot. Uh, before we get into, um, you know, some of the, 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 the substantive, uh, elements of the case itself, I'm just curious about the, the point you just mentioned about, uh, you know, sort of going back and saying, well, you know, I got it wrong in that, in that prior case and, you know, sort of your, your understanding of where the justices stood not being, uh, exactly the way that it turned out. Why do you think that was? Do you think their, their thinking changed? Was there something about this case that, that gave them pause? Why do you think it turned the way it did? I think that Justice Thomas just thought that he had voted the wrong way the first time around. Um, and it, it may be that this case pushed him to that position. You know, Prendy was the case that he realized, no, this this can't, you can't let judges make these types of decisions that increase a defendant's sentence above the 
ordinary sentencing range, that that would become an element of the offense that a jury has to find beyond reasonable doubt. So it's possible that Apprendi pushed him further in that direction, but he did repudiate his earlier vote in Almendera's Torres. Sure. So the Supreme Court, just getting into the to the ruling and into the case itself, rules that the New Jersey procedure challenged in this case is an unacceptable departure from the jury tradition that is an indispensable part of our criminal justice system, and that the due process clause of the Constitution and the 14th Amendment require that a jury on the basis of proof beyond a reasonable doubt make the factual determination authorizing an increase in the maximum prison sentence. So I imagine, as you know, you've sort of alluded to here, you put a lot of thought into these dynamics. And I'm curious how you argue the state's case. You know, I imagine you anticipated that that's, um, you know, sort of the other side of it. I'm just curious what your argument was in, in response to that, trying to persuade the justices that uh, it's it's not that way. My argument was very narrow, that the hate crime statute punished a person based on their motive. And motive has always been a traditional sentencing factor. The United States Supreme Court said that over 100 years ago. The Solicitor General's office came in as amicus on behalf of the state of New Jersey. And I was concerned about that, even though they were coming in to support me and my side, I was concerned about their argument because theirs was much broader. In the federal system at the time, in cases such as drug offenses, the federal government had to prove to the jury that the defendant possessed drugs. But then prove to the court, to the sentencing court, the amount of drugs and the type of drugs. Now, in New Jersey, the type of drugs and amount of drugs have always been elements of the offense because the amount of drug and the type of drug determines the defendant's sentence. You know, if you have a small amount of marijuana, you're going to be charged less harshly than if you're carrying a couple of kilos of, of heroin, you know, secreted in, in, the, in your car. Um, so my position was very narrow. The uh, Solicitor General's position was much broader. They had many federal statutes that needed to be upheld um, because if Apprendi came down against us, that would require the federal government to prove to the jury the type of drug, the amount of drug. But, and so I tried to make the distinction that motive has always been a traditional sentencing factor that judges can apply and and make the finding that increases a defendant's sentence above the ordinary maximum term for the underlying offense. So I'm curious about uh, when it comes to Apprendi's alleged racial animus and the elements that uh, would have pushed the the, the sentencing over um, and above what it was and how the Supreme Court took issue with that not being uh, sufficiently left to the jury. Were, were those elements not part of the trial? It sounds like from the facts that you you know talked about earlier that uh, that very heinous part of the crime had to have been presented to the jury since it's so much of, of, of what this person did. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious the details of where that came in, where it didn't come in uh, in terms of the jury and the judge and, and and what the Supreme Court found issue with. In this particular case, um, Charles Apprendi did plead guilty. He waived his right to a jury trial and pleaded guilty. And the, one of the crimes that he pleaded guilty to was possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose. And in New Jersey, we'd have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, either to a jury or through a defendant's guilty plea, that the defendant possessed the weapon, that he used the weapon, and he used the weapon for an unlawful purpose against another person. So at his plea hearing, and he has to give, um, you know, a statement as to an allocution as to the facts of the case. And he acknowledged that he had fired the gun into the house in order to scare the family. But he didn't have to testify as to why he wanted to scare the family. That's more of his, we were arguing his motive. And under New Jersey's hate crime statute, his motive would be left to the judge to make that finding. And in a way, This bifurcation really, we've argued, helped the defendant because if you've got a crime and the defendant is going to trial before a jury and there is a racial animus aspect to it, that's very damaging and prejudicial to the defendant. That's information that most defendants would rather that the jury not hear. So to do it in this bifurcated manner where the jury makes the finding of of the elements of the offense of possession of a weapon for an unlawful purpose. And then it goes to the judge to decide whether or not there's racial animus. And there was a full hearing here. Um, the, the county prosecutor 
presented his witnesses. Apprendi presented his own witnesses. He testified himself. He claimed that he wasn't acting out of racial animus, but that the victim's purple door set him off and he used it because he was angered by this purple door. So he used it as a target. Um, and it had there been a jury trial and, for, and now how it, how all state statutes must work under the various bias crime laws, all of that damage, damaging information regarding a defendant's um, history of racial animosity um, or gender or religion, whatever, has to be submitted to the jury and proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's very prejudicial information. So ultimately, I'm, I'm curious how you felt about the court's decision. I, I'm curious, like, you know, when when the decision came out, I believe it was on, uh, let's see, decided June 26, 2000, you know, you get the news. Was this what you were expecting? Was it not? How did you react? Tell us about what that was like. I thought when I left the courtroom that I had a very good chance of winning the argument. Um, and I was personally devastated when we lost. I felt terrible for the family. I knew what they had been going through. You know, the family who was the victims in this case, who were a young family. It was the, the mother, the father, and three young kids. And they had been traumatized by this. Um, you know, the, the four bullet, four nights, bullets went through their house. Um, one of the nights, the bullets whizzed over the bed of the youngest boy. Um, on another night, a bullet lodged in the bedroom wall of the daughter. So I knew that they were just devastated by this, um, that Charles Apprendi seemed to have gotten away with something. I've come to decide that it, the decision was correct and that any factor that increases a defendant's sentence above the ordinary maximum term Regardless of what you call it, Justice Scalia called it in, in Ring versus Arizona. He, he said you could call it Mary Jane. It doesn't what, matter what you call it. If it increases a defendant's sentence above the ordinary maximum term, it has to go to the jury um, and be found beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's probably the right solution. Again, that means that for biased crimes, all of this damaging information is going to be submitted to the jury. And that's generally information that defendants don't want the jury to hear. So it's almost a be careful what you wish for kind of thing, I think, for the defendant. But ultimately, I, you know, there was a lot of shakeout from this case. There were statutes and the federal guideline, federal sentencing guidelines were all in an upheaval following this case. But I think it's shaking out okay. And if it means that juries have to make these decisions and the prosecutors have to prove these elements to them beyond a reasonable doubt, that seems to be okay. That, that's the way it should work. So in the alternative, in the way that this ought to work, in the way that the Supreme Court says it ought to work, is it a jury question? What, what is the jury charged with trying to determine such that the due process is satisfied? When a defendant is now charged with a biased crime, the jury would have to find beyond a reasonable doubt, not only the elements of the underlying crime, be it murder, armed robbery, assault, but the jury would also have to find that the defendant committed the crime with the purpose to intimidate the victim based on the victim's race, gender, religion, sexual orientation. All of that information now has to go to the jury and be found beyond a reasonable doubt by the jury before the defendant's sentence can be increased. Sure. Um, so the last couple of questions I have, one of them is, what's the biggest misconception that you believe people have about Supreme Court practice? In other words, you know, reality versus rumor. Like, what's the biggest misconception you think is out there being someone that's uh, actually been there and done it? I think most, most attorneys who appear before the United States Supreme Court um, are steeped in Supreme Court practice. They have graduated from, you know, double Ivy, undergraduate Ivy League diploma, law diploma from a uh, an Ivy League school. They go on to clerk for federal judges and then on the Federal Court of Appeals somewhere, and then hopefully they get a clerkship with the United States Supreme Court. Um, but you don't have to go that route. And I'm living proof of that. 
I sometimes you just have to be in the right place at the right time and have a case come. And it just, there's so much that is involved in getting a case up to the United States Supreme Court. A lot of it is luck. Most of it is timing. And you just have to rise to the occasion. Um, it is a, it's a very overwhelming thing to stand in front of the altar of the appellate gods and argue a case that you've been living with for four years or more. Because, I, again, I had this in the state court system. But I only had 20 minutes to argue. I had 20 minutes to convince this court that my position was right, that that motive was historically a traditional sentencing factor. And that's very daunting. But it can be done. Certainly. Um, last question I wanted to ask uh, more generally is what advice do you have for law students today? Folks, I guess, like myself and folks younger than myself, people thinking of law school, thinking about careers, uh, maybe much like yours, aspiring to perhaps argue in the Supreme Court one day. What, what advice would you would you give? Uh, follow your passions in law. I chose to go into criminal law over publishing law. Um, I, you know, I, I think that law students today have it much a uh, much more difficult time trying to make these decisions because law school is so expensive now. And I think a lot of law students make their decision based on the amount of debt that they have to pay off. And that's really a shame because I love criminal law. I love, I have loved my career as a prosecutor. I love my career representing the victims first in New York and then in New Jersey, victims of, of unspeakable crimes. And but I didn't have the financial pressures of student loans, so I didn't have to worry about that. But if you want to argue in the United States Supreme Court, if that's really what you want to do, then you have to get on law review and get a clerkship and make your way to the Solicitor General's office in Washington, D.C., because that's really the only surefire way of arguing a case before the United States Supreme Court is to be in the Solicitor General's office. Um, those attorneys represent the government of the United States at the, new, at the United States Supreme Court level. The rest of us just have to hope and wish and pray that one day one of your cases makes it up to the United States Supreme Court. But it can be done. I am living proof that it can be done. Because I, I was an anonymous state's attorney. No one knew who I was. And I think that was very daunting, too. I know the Solicitor General's office was concerned. Not that, you know, they didn't know who I was. I was an unknown. Um, and, you know, you're before the United States Supreme Court. You really have to know what you're doing. Do you think that the Supreme – and this is a follow-up I just came up with and we'll finish in a moment. But do you think the, the justices on the Supreme Court put stock into who's in front of them? In other words, are they thinking, well, who's this person from wherever? I mean, we, you know, the Solicitor General, well, they're here, but then we've got the state's attorney. Do you think they think about that at all or do you think everyone has their, their fair shake, their, their day in court, so to speak? I think it depends on how you present the case. If you're an unknown and you go there and you're ill-prepared, it's going to show. If you're an unknown and you go there and you are ready to fight whatever is coming at you, they will take note of that too. Um, I don't think that I was at a disadvantage because it was my first case. Would I have been at a better advantage if I had argued there 20 times before? Absolutely. You know, one of the things I had to do was get acclimated to my surroundings. I, I was comfortable in the United, in the Supreme Court of New Jersey. I had never argued in the United States Supreme Court before. So like I said earlier that, you know, you're not an, on home court. You're the away team. And I can understand why the Solicitor General's office wants to be there just in case I ended up standing before the podium and nothing came out because you just don't know. I mean, you can hope and pray that you're going to have a good argument day. And I was very lucky that I did. But, you know, I've had arguments where I've walked out and said, wow, I wish I wish I could do that again because I, I messed up. Um, and but I, I the Supreme Court, I shall say, did not cut me any slack and did not cut my adversary any slack. So the first the point that we were first time attorneys appearing before the court didn't seem to bother the justices in terms of, you know, they, they took off the kid gloves and we were punching bags for the hour that we stood before the court 
Uh, well, uh, this has been BC Law's Just Law Podcast. I'm Tom Blake. We're talking to Lisa Gotchman, a career appellate prosecutor. Her experiences at the United States Supreme Court. Lisa, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And I hope that your, your listeners will read my book, At the Altar of the Appellate Gods, Arguing Before the United States Supreme Court. It's a fun memoir. There's law in there. I mean, it, it traces the history of Apprendi versus New Jersey, you know, from the crime in Vineland, New Jersey, all the way to the United States Supreme Court. But there's lots of fun stories about, you know, what it was like to actually argue there. Um, you'll learn about my my son and my husband and just what we all went through to get me to the United States Supreme Court. Very cool. Uh, well, Lisa, thank you again. Thank you so much, Tom.